Good morning. Today is the 24th day of Tevis, the 5th of January. It's the Yorzeit, the day of passing of the Alter Rebbe, the founder of Chabad, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, the, the, of the Tanya, and so on. We're up to, we're in the mitzvah of sanctifying God, and we said, and, and we're at this line starts with Kasherim Mosert Nafsham Hamash. The soul sacrifice stems from its will. So when the source, what causes sacrifice? Again, we said we have two instances of sacrifice. So what causes it is the will that is above the reason. It transcends intellect. Here it's reason, like the and as Rambam writes, one is obligated to sacrifice himself rather than to deceive someone who's intimidating him, an intimidator. Right? You're not allowed to deceive them. It's a very interesting thing. Why not? So you say, oh, I believe whatever you want. You go home and you continue to serve God. Why is that? Because that's the intellect's argument. The intellect says, live to fight another day. <laughs> it's, a very, it's, it's, it's a logical argument. It makes a lot of sense. Say something false today, and then live tomorrow. But what's he explaining? He's explaining the whole point here. First of all, who says this is ever going to happen again? <laughs> It could be this is a one, one, once in a lifetime event where you're uh, threatened with your life if you don't uh, express faith, false faith. It says the whole point of faith is to be above intellect, is to be above reason. So if now in this situation you also go according to intellect, so you've missed the whole point. It's like saying, well, okay, it's Pesach. And you're supposed to eat matzah, but, ah, uh, you know, it's very hard to eat matzah. I don't feel well afterwards. Intellectually, it makes sense that I should eat uh, regular bread. <laughs> so what's the whole point? The whole point is you're doing something against your intellect. The person wakes up in the morning and says, um, okay, I'd rather sleep. I don't want to go daven. I don't want to go pray. I don't want to go do this. You could do that. My intellect says, it's better to sleep now. I'll, I'll be more refreshed later. And then I'll do it. Which, by the way, was a very big argument against the Hasidim at some point. Because the people that daven late, they said, what, what are you doing? If you wake up at 5 in the morning and you have all these preparations, which is exactly how the whole thing of davening late started, that there was a lot of preparation, more preparation than usual, then okay, I understand that to get to the point where you can daven, I understand that it takes time. But if you sleep until 10, and then you wonder why the day is over, and so, so, so you missed the whole point. You don't understand it. So it says this mitzvah, to sanctify God, requires you to go beyond the intellectual argument. The intellectual argument would be, of course, say whatever they want, and live another day. But, but that's the point. You may never come to this opportunity again. And the what you're supposed to do is to muster your, your, your faith or your will that is above the reason. And if you miss it now, so you miss the whole mitzvah. It's like, it's, like, it's like missing any mitzvah. Except this one, it says, is not like matzah on Pesach. This is the purpose of life. It says to get to that will that is above reason, that is exactly the purpose of life. And you can't really say that about matzah. You can't really say that about any of the other things. They're not exactly revealing the will that's above reason because your life is not at stake. It's not the same thing. This is a completely different level. And from people who, um, ne next week, uh, on Friday, exactly in a week, will be Zusha's, Reb Zusha's uh, Yorzeit, the second of Shvat. And Reb Zusha, and many people, not just him, there's this famous story when he was 15, when his father passed away, that he... Uh, his father was, was not wealthy, but he had some money, and he loaned it to a lot of people. And he loaned it also to, uh, to non-Jews. And from all, the, uh, from all that was left, it wasn't enough. 
And Zusha was the eldest son. They, there were four sons. And the Melech was the youngest. I guess it was older than 15, because I think there was 20 years between them. So it's probably 20. And um, Zusha was the one who was appointed to go and collect some of the uh, loans so that they would have something to live off of. And so he went around. And one of the people that, he, that his father loaned money to was, a, was some wealthy aristocrat, non-Jew. And he went into his house, he came to his house, he was invited in. And it turns out that there was a, a, a young woman there who was the wife. And she, she liked him. <laughs> and she decided to try to seduce him. And so she tried. And he, of course, ran away, like Yosef. But she didn't give up. She chased after him. And she kept chasing him. And it says he even jumped on a wagon, and she jumped on it, and she just followed all around the, the town, where, wherever he went. So eventually he, he, he saw that he, he can't get rid of her. He ran into a, into a mill where they grind uh, grain, and he said, Shoin, <laughs> genug, enough, I, I can't stand it anymore. And he put his head between the grindstones. He said, I'll, I'll die. I don't want to, it's a nevera, it's a terrible nevera, it's a yaregu bal And so he, he, he put his head, that's it, if she comes in here, then, that, then that's it. I'm, uh, I'm giving my life up. And she disappeared suddenly. And he said from that moment on, his eyes opened, his, his mind opened, everything opened. Like suddenly he received something that he didn't have it all before. He became a holy person. And he attributed it his whole life to that willingness to sacrifice himself. So that's sanctifying God's name. That's exactly what it is. So he says, well, what have we been saying? That this opens up the wisdom and the understanding to have a new relation, a new, a new union, a, a, new, a new relationship. And that's what allows you to become a new person. So people come out of these events different people. Like every single soldier who is now in Gaza, so he's going through this at some level because he's sanctifying God's name. He's, he's coming and saying, I'm willing to, to die in order to protect people from bloodshed. That's, that's what I'm trying to do. So, Just as he, here below, went above his reason, above his intellect, so he awakens above a revelation of what is God's infinite light, which is above reason, above intellect. And that's what he receives. And this light that transcends the wisdom of Atzilus. It's even higher than the whole world of Atzilus, of emanation. It's where there's only consciousness of God. This light, this revelation of God that is higher than that is now in clothing itself and enlightening itself, illuminating his wisdom. So from there, from the wisdom, it, it, like we said, there's 32 pathways. By the way, I keep forgetting to mention this. This ties into, <laughs> pun intended, to the mitzvah of Titus that we learned. Because how many, how many fringes do you have? 32. They, I forgot to mention, those 32, they are the example of the 32 pathways of wisdom. Except here it's, it's from the wisdom of Za into his feminine counterpart. Because we said it's, it's, it's lower down. But on, on the top, it's supposed to be 32 pathways inside between, maybe you'd call it the two hemispheres of the brain. I don't know if there are 32 pathways or whatever. Again, it's... A, we just had a discussion last night about how many bones are there in the body. So you learned anatomy. How many bones are there? Really, 248. So if you look in Wikipedia, a long time ago I, I researched this, I was just trying to figure out what, what the 248, because there's a Mishnah in Ohalot that tells you what the bones are, and it, it lists them. Suffice it to say, we, we don't understand that Mishnah. We don't understand the... I mean, in general lines it makes sense, but in, 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 in particular it's hard to connected to the anatomy that we're aware of. But then somebody said, uh, this was already 30 years ago when I saw this, um, there's no set number of bones in anyone's body. Why? Because bones fuse. Cartilage fuses and it becomes bone. And so when you're, a when you're born, you have a lot more bones. You have a lot more cartilage 
that is disconnected and slowly it fuses and becomes a bone, it hardens uh, like when you're about 18. You so you start out with something like 270 bones and the adult who, who is, I guess, 30 or 40 years old has 207. So 70 or uh, 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 206, actually, they say 206. So between 270 and 26, the average is 238, not exactly 248. But this article that I read many years ago said that the 248 is the number at age 18, where not everything is fused yet, and you're, you're, you're on the way. <laughs> okay, so it's an interesting uh, thing. But you're, right away you see that if there's no set amount throughout life, you can't say there's 248 and just say because an anatomically that's how it is. Even anatomically, you can't decide how many there are. So what does it mean? It means it's a, it's a spiritual statement. They're saying 248 because this is a, a number. It's connected to reality. It's somewhere in between 270 and 206. It's a number that's connected to it, but it is meant to illustrate something spiritual, not something physical. It, like I said, it, it doesn't contradict reality, but it's not a scientific empirical statement about reality. Same thing here. There's 32 pathways between the right and left hemisphere. What exactly are we talking about? Is there something in there that's 32? I don't know. So this creates the particular soul of the person. This is what he gains from, from this. And the same thing is what you're supposed to gain when you say Shema and when you do Nefil Sapayim, when you fall on your face, uh, when you say Tachnun. Thus, the mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem causes the revelation of Orin Sof, which is Sov of Amen, to be manifest on the lowest plane. So that's what this mitzvah is supposed to do. It's supposed to bring down the light, the revelation of God that is called the sovev, right? The encompassing, encircling light, which is beyond what we can usually uh, fathom and understand. This is the intent of the verse. This is, uh, where do we, uh, did he even mention the verse in the beginning? I don't remember. I think he did. Uh, yeah, he mentioned the verse. We started with it. And I will be sanctified in the midst of the children of Israel, or the, in the midst of the Israel. Betoch b'nei Israel. What do you mean inside? Now we understand the, the word inside, this, this, this relative pronoun, inside. How, how is it inside? That through this self-sacrifice, or in sof, so this infinite light which is holy and separate, will be revealed and the operative word is within the Israelites themselves meaning inside, inside my wisdom my understanding, creating a different persona so the person that comes out from a test where he's required to sacrifice himself comes out a different person not just because of the experience but because something is revealed to them and therefore this mitzvah surpasses all the 248 positive commandments. says it's, it's so high, this, it's so elevated, it's so different, because you're giving up your ver- all your intellect. All the intellectual arguments for staying alive, they fall away. And we said that by us, thank God, we're not facing this day to day. So that's what you do in Shema. You're supposed to, in Shema, give up <coughs> all of your understanding. And to, to say that the Shem is one, to say that God is one, the more you study, the more you have to give up. You have to say all of this, especially if a person studies Talmud. This is studies Talmud. I'm not even talking about nature. The, the nature is, in the end, you feel is one, because you see that it functions very nicely. But when you look at Torah, you look at the Talmud, you, when you know people, and you know their opinions, and you know their, 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 um, call it their, their, their unique <laughs> perspectives on reality, and you have to say, all oh, this is one in the end, you have to give up a lot. You mamish have to forsake your, your understanding and your wisdom. You have to put it aside to say this is really one. And, and that's the act of sacrifice that you're doing there, the act of sanctifying God. And for this reason, this mitzvah, when a person performs it, even someone who spends his entire life in the service of studying Torah and, and performing the commandments will not reach a level of one who, even though he transgressed his entire life, he never kept anything, 
But afterwards, he turned to God in complete tshuva, and he sacrificed his life for the sanctification of God's name, so you can't compare. Who was this? Who did every single possible transgression, and then did tshuva at the very end, but not just tshuva, he did tshuva in a way that he sacrificed himself, he gave himself uh, over completely. Who was this? So this is a story of Rabbi Lazar ben Dordaya. They called him Rabbi at the end, even though he, wasn't, he was very far from being a rabbi. He was the completely opposite. Whose soul expired as he wept. Now, this is already, this is very telling. I don't know that, that this is where we take it from. But the whole idea of leaning down when we say Tachanun and covering our face is very similar to what he did. He put his head between his knees, meaning he, he, he pushed himself down this way. He covered his head, apparently, and he cried. He cried in tshuva, in, in repentance for everything that he had done, to the point where he, they say that his, his soul departed eventually from all the crying that he did. He was so in remorse about what he had done his whole life, how he had thrown his whole life away. And then a batko, a, what, they, what they call a voice from heaven, emerged, and the people who could hear it heard it say that he is uh, welcome to the world, uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the paradise, to the Garden of Eden. What Torah did he have? He didn't have anything. He, he didn't study anything. He didn't learn anything. Then they called him, the, the, the batko itself says, the, the voice itself says, Rabbi Elazar ben Tortai. How did some become a rabbi? How did some? So we learn from this that the fact that he was able to surmount all his intellect, all his understanding, all his reason, which until then, until that moment, was completely devoted only the, for the pursuit of his bodily pleasures and the lowest of the bodily pleasures. All the time, that's all he wanted. And he was wealthy, apparently, because he had, uh, he had the money to pursue these pleasures. And in Roman times, he had to have a lot of money to pursue these pleasures because people were generally poor. Uh, so he had... And he used it all in the wrong way, but the fact that he then sanctified God, that's what it's called, sanctifying God's name, or sanctifying God by elevating above all his, into all the, even his nature, he was so imbued in this. They say there was not a single uh, house of, what do we call it, of lootery, Ill repute. of ill repute, <laughs> that he had not frequented. Every single one from here to Rome. He, he'd been in all of them. And that, that ability, they say, is, is something that even someone who follows all the commandments is not able to. Now, somebody who compares it now says, what do you mean? I spent my whole life doing what God said, and this guy, at the end of his life, I don't know how long, for two hours, three hours, four hours, eight hours, 20 hours, who knows? He cried and he died from his, his crying, he was able to sur surpass me. How is that even possible? Because it's a di it requires a different level. It, it's a completely different level of life. To be able to do that is to tap into the will and the, and the, and the faith which is above all your a normal actions. And so, so that's one of the examples that uh, that's where this is supposed to lead. It, it, it's a tapping into a revelation of godliness that is simply impossible any other way. Now, there's a little bit of a contradiction. We'll do more of it on Sunday, but just to mention it. The problem, the, the question that arises is, what do you mean? I thought that every single mitzvah we do is bringing down the encompassing light. That's, that's the nature of the mitzvah. The, the mitzvah is something that's not understood. If I, in a million years, would study the universe, I would not come to the conclusion I should put on tefillin. I, I would never come to, to, that, to that conclusion. It's a conclusion that's above my reason. That's, it is a revelation of God's will. So how is this even higher than that? How can this be even higher than that? Because every mitzvah is like that. So if I did mitzvahs, if I performed commandments my whole life, I've been connected to that same revelation of godliness the whole time. God's will has been part of my life anyway. But you were given, you were given that mitzvah. Okay. You so what you're saying is that he came to it. Right. What you're saying is 
everything that I do is not a product of my own doing. Meaning, I am a, beneficia I'm a beneficiary of what Moses did, of what all the generations did after. And we call that the Shekhinah. Today it's called the Shekhinah. All that, that I'm able to, to serve God yes. using the commandment, it's called the Shekhinah. Why is it the Shekhinah? Because it, 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 it's not me. The Shekhinah gave me all this. Yeah. The, the divine presence that's been in the people for 3,000 years and has developed all this, it's given this to me. I just uh, come and do it. And it's true, it reveals it, that, that light, but it's not my doing. I'm, I'm just a willing participant. But I'm a participant. And here you said the, the biggest answer is, or maybe, maybe, the, maybe the, even a bigger one, but so one of the most important answers is, here he created a pathway that nobody else had ever created. He had to break through his confines, through his reason. And, and the, that's why the Rebbe always says that when a person fir first puts on tefillin, when you go on, uh, on mitzvah tefillin, and you put, he says the person who's putting the tefillin on him, who's from, who's a uh, Lubavitcher, or whatever he is, and he keeps uh, the commandments, he now is seeing, the first time this person puts on tefillin, if it's the first time in his life, he's now seeing a revelation of, a, of the Yechida. Something completely different. The one who puts it on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the person who's putting it on him, he now he should know that he's now in the presence of something that is completely that is different than everything that he does. It's yeah. not the same thing as when you put on film. Yeah. It's called a it's a big deal. That's why people love to write that they found a karkafta, it's called. A person who is a skull cap. <laughs> a skull. <laughs> I, I it's basically scalp. Right. The Indians had scalping, and the Jews have scalping. The difference is that the Indians would kill you. Yeah, yeah. And it was a way of showing that the, a prize after they had killed you. They took off the scalp. They used, I don't think it was the way they killed. I think it was like the prize afterwards. And by Jews, scalping means to put fill in on a person the first time. It's exactly, the, think about it, it's even the same place. What did I do? I, reveal, I, ha I, I had the opportunity to be a participant in the revelation of the highest level. But it's because this person now broke out of all of his uh, confines. He did this. The first time he did this. So this is like even more than that. Okay, so we'll continue. God willing, and finish it on Sunday. In the meantime, Shabbat Shalom. With Shabbos. Do you want me to take this?